So the title of this video might be a bit confusing, since there have been a lot of disasters and a lot of deaths in the Dead Space universe. Of course, the most famous of these is the Necromorph outbreak that infected Aegis 7 and the USG Ishimura, which is where both the first Dead Space game and its 2023 remake take place. The point of this video is to count every death on the mining colony of Aegis 7, which I'll be updating as we follow the events leading up to what happens in the actual game. While that may sound simple enough, the story actually spans across comics, movies, novels, spin-offs, and even an online ARG, all of which seem to be canon. And yes, this includes the puzzle game from 2010. Luckily for us, the Aegis 7 incident is mostly contained within these pieces of media, and the Dead Space remake manages to stay pretty consistent with the established canon. So with our death counter set to zero, let's get into it. First, let's cover a bit of background. A few hundred years into the future, a company known as the Concordance Extraction Corporation, or the CEC, runs its business by mining the natural resources of distant planets. Following the invention of faster-than-light travel with the shockpoint drive, the CEC developed a handful of deep space vehicles known as planet crackers. These massive ships were designed to help break planets apart and harvest resources that have long since been depleted from Earth. Nearly 40 celestial bodies across the universe were subjected to this planet cracking process, with 34 of these being done by the organization's oldest and largest ship known as the USG Ishimura. Around the turn of the 26th century, the CEC sets its eyes on the Aegis system, as one of its planets seems to be especially rich with resources like cobalt, osmium, and silicone. However, the Earth's unified government, appropriately named EarthGov, declared this a restricted region over 200 years ago for reasons unknown to the public. Being the morally great corporation that they are, the CEC decides to secretly break government order, and around June of 2506, they set up a mining colony on the planet Aegis 7, hoping to get away with one of the biggest hauls the company has ever seen. And now, with all that out of the way, we have the location, date, and premise covered. So now we just need a rough estimate of the colony's population, which we'll need to use a bit of math to figure out. To support a mining operation of this size, the colony needed to include structures like vehicle bays, medical labs, and of course, residential areas for its population. In the Dead Space prequel comics, published in the months leading up to the first game's release, we see that the living quarters are divided into letter blocks, numbered apartments, and a two-dimensional array of labeled rows. Throughout the story, we're given five different examples of apartments sorted in this way. If we convert all letters to serial numbers, eliminate duplicates from the sample, calculate a rough estimate of each parameter's max value, and multiply them all together, we can guess they had about 26,000 apartments. Most examples are shown to house a single person, but we do see a few cases where a married couple can live in one apartment. To keep things simple, let's just bump this number up to 30,000 which for reference is equal to about half of 2020's Olympic Stadium capacity and around twice the attendance of 2022's largest furry convention. Over the next two and a half years, the colony's preparation for planet cracking goes pretty smoothly. They only recorded three work-related deaths, but around day 890 of the operation, something begins to cause some unusual tremors around the colony. 30 meters. Whatever it is, it's just up ahead. Any idea what it is? Not a clue. Protocol says we're required to check it out, so we're checking it out. This is Jennifer Barrow, a geologist, surveyor, and dig team leader for the CEC. There's something strange about these walls. There's evidence of chemical weathering. I'm gonna radio the colony. Somebody's been messing around out here. Jen, you're gonna wanna look at this. Barrow, this is Cortez and PSAC. Is that... Can that possibly be what I think it is? And here is Vera Cortez, currently working for Planetside Security, or PSEC, which is basically the police force of the mining colony. This seemingly alien artifact is catching everyone's attention because back on Earth in the year 2214, a nearly identical object known as the Black Marker was discovered by a geophysicist named Michael Altman. The origin and purpose of this marker were both unclear, but those who studied it believed it held deeper truths about human evolution, or maybe even the answer to eternal life. This, in addition to the prophetic visions seen by multiple research teams, led to the founding of Unitology, a religion that defined itself over the next 100 years and believed the marker would bring an age where everyone is united as one in life after death. 
For reasons unknown to the public, Michael Altman was assassinated by the Earth's government shortly after the marker's discovery, and the facility researching the artifact was destroyed. Altman's mysterious death led to him becoming a sort of martyr figure for unitology, and since the black marker never resurfaced from the ocean it sank into, the church could only hope for the day that a marker would be discovered once again. This is Aegis Colony. Artifact discovered. Could be a second marker. Please advise. Unitologist Church has been notified. They're awaiting specs. My god. We found it. Launch of Ishimura on schedule. Arrival on station one month. Prepare the artifact for transfer to the ship. Altman be praised. The news of this discovery quickly spreads throughout the colony, which is greeted with a mixture of confusion, curiosity, skepticism, and in some cases, fanatical joy. For 200 years, Unitology has sought the truth. When Michael Altman spread his word, few people believed him. Now finally we have proof that we have been right all along. Here on this very planet, we found another marker. Yeah, I thought the marker's supposed to be black. This thing's red. Newman. I'm just saying, this guy's a, what, a priest or something? Deacon Abbott, VTM engineer first class. And yes, lay preacher. Who are you? Newman, p -Sec. Abraham Newman, also known as Bram, is the main character of the comics. He's another member of Planetside Security and is currently partnered with Cortez, who happens to be a unitologist herself. Newman has a bit of a distaste for her beliefs, as unitology was somehow responsible for a divorce with his ex-wife. You can't hide the truth, Mr. Newman. That's what they tried to do when they killed Altman. But we're still here. Ah, don't be stupid. Ram, that's enough. Oh, come on. This is the last straw. You can't seriously buy this crap. We already conquered heaven, and guess what? God wasn't home. Your God, perhaps. Our God is very much in residence. A lot of it going around. How long you been on Colony? Since day one. Why? I've seen this before. Say hello to Dr. Tom Shirello. Chief Medical Officer on the Aegis 7 Colony. For the past two and a half years, you guys have done all the work. Done all the excavation prep. Yeah, so? And then the Ishimura shock points in at the last minute and grabs all the glory. Enough to make anyone depressed, really. I ain't depressed. I just can't sleep. This patient, named Brant Harris, is suffering from one of many recent cases of insomnia since the marker's discovery. Try to keep the names of Harris and Dr. Shirello in mind if you can. Sure, sure. Look, all I can do is prescribe you some sedative pills. That's 20 cases in three days. Have you really seen this before? <laughs> Something damn strange is going on around here. In the month leading up to the Ishimura's arrival, cases of insomnia, paranoia, and even violent assault began to skyrocket. Some would brush it off as a coincidence, while others believed it to be directly caused by the marker's discovery. You know what I think? I think the thing is cursed. I mean, look what's happened since they found it. I don't remember you getting paid to think, Jackson. <laughs> okay, while Jackson doesn't end up being that significant, this guy, Colin Barrow, is extremely important to the story. His name might sound familiar since the new red marker was found by Jennifer Barrow, Colin's wife. Try to remember these two characters as well if at all possible. Now, about three weeks after the red marker's discovery, things finally start to fall apart. Assault in progress at Surgery 1, West Sector 9, Level 5. Repeat assault. Newman and Cortez responding. Oh, thank God. Hurry. He's got a line cutter. PSEC, drop the cutter. This quack tried to con me. He said the pills would make me sleep, but they don't. Every night I lie there in these things, these things I think about. I don't want to, but I can't stop it. Hey, hey, listen to me. You're stressed out, I know, but this is not going to help you. Just give me the cutter and let's talk about this. No, you're lying. Newman dodges the plasma bolt and Harris is wrestled to the ground, but the group quickly realizes that Harris wasn't aiming for them. Katie! Katie was my assistant for five years. She was devoted to her job, but that devotion got Katie killed. Katie saved my life. If she hadn't called PSEC, I'd be lying in the morgue right now. I'd gladly make that exchange, and I- I know you would, Tom. Katie? But there are more important things you have to do, Tom. No, no, this isn't real. Tom, are you all right? Sorry, folks. Tom's not feeling too good. Thanks for coming. 
Determined to get to the bottom of the whole situation, Dr. Shirello asks Newman to take him to the marker's dig site, where he'll see if he can detect any sort of frequency causing the colony's hallucinations and dementia. Once they arrive, Newman is surprised to find Cortez in a prayer group led by Deacon Abbott, since she was supposedly taking a sick day. Cortez? Abbott said I should come here instead. You're supposed to be laid up sick. Is there a problem here? No, Carl. My partner just hasn't seen the light yet. Seen the light? You're coming back with me, Cortez. I'm booking you in for a psych eval. No! Hey, you guys! You're supposed to be guarding this thing. Give me some backup here. You're disturbing the prayer group. You should leave. What? It's these idiots who should leave. Uh, what just happened? I don't know, but I don't want to be around it a second longer. Newman is escorted out, but the encounter gave Shirello just enough time to get the information he needed. Not a thing. Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Black Band, Shock Point, you name it. As far as science is concerned, it's just a rock. I've worked with Cortez on three colonies. I'm telling you, that just wasn't her. And the miners? Whether you can detect it or not, that rock is behind us somehow. This can't go on. Hey, Bram, have you seen this? Marla Jensen, a talented systems analyst and Newman's current love interest, uses her own approach to unraveling the marker's true nature. Look at these symbols. Do you think they're carved into it? It's like they're glowing. A lot of the symbols are repeated, like it's a code or language. This is incredible. I mean, it looks like there are similarities to cladistic math in there. <laughs> what? I'm sorry, I know this stuff gets you hot, but the church has been trying to decipher the black marker for centuries, and they've got squat. So they say. A fresh perspective might be all it needs. A few days later, local day 916, the same colonist that escorted Newman away from the prayer group kills someone over a dispute of who gets to guard the marker. Things are becoming increasingly clear to Newman that this operation needs to be stopped, so he brings the issue directly to the colony manager, Hanford Carthusia. Let me get this straight. This operation has already cost hundreds of billions over two and a half years. Aegis 7 has trillions worth of salable resources. But now, less than three weeks from planet crack, you want me to abort because a couple of miners died. Miners! Miners! I'll be very clear, Commander. Not a chance! In four days' time, the artifact will be lifted and brought here to await the Ishimura. When the ship arrives, it will be transferred on board. You're bringing it into the colony. Are you blind? Goodbye, gentlemen. Thanks for your input. <sighs> Within the next few days, the USG Ishimura departs from Earth's orbit and prepares to shock point to Aegis 7. And on day 920, the marker's extraction begins. Stop. That's better. Uh, sorry, Lexine. I was next to the recharging station. I'm mad at you, Sam Caldwell. Why? Because you somehow forgot to tell me what you're doing today. You're extracting a marker. This is a big deal. We don't know if it's a marker or just a big rock. That's why we're doing this. Sam Caldwell, if you had an imagination, you'd be dangerous. We'll see about that tonight. Ooh, I look forward to it. Gotta go, honey. I love you. I love you too. Later. Now we finally get to see the events of Dead Space Extraction, which opens with one of my favorite gags in the whole series. Sam, come on. Get suited up quicker, the only date you'll have is with an overtime sheet. <laughs> ah, that wasn't the player character. This game's in first person. This trio of engineers, named Egan, Sterling, and Caldwell, are tasked with bringing the marker into the colony for extraction by the Ishimura, which is set to arrive later that day. Get suited up quicker, the only date you'll have is with an overtime sheet. <laughs> Say no more. Lexine's already mad at me, she'd kill me if I bailed on her. Well, everyone else is standing by. All we're waiting for is you, so don't expect me to make excuses if we're still working tonight. <laughs> I actually really like this game, even if the concept of a rail shooter for the Wii didn't sound that interesting at first. Just one thing to note is that for hostile encounters, I'll generally be aiming for the torso or using weapons like the flamethrower, since that's less likely to get me demonetized compared to the intended limb-based combat. You seen that vidlog of the marker that's going around? Looks just like the one back on Earth. Just like the one the unitologists claim is back on Earth, you mean? I mean, come on, what are the odds? And there it is. 
Before the marker is moved, your team has to secure the tracks previously laid out by those assigned to guard the marker. But after Sam Caldwell bolts everything down with his rivet gun, he starts to hear strange whispering. Gothir is actually a character from the official online ARG. Jane Gothier was a colonist whose fingers were lost during a search and rescue mission, but her story isn't that important, and these whispers are just another delusion experienced by those who come into contact with the marker. Meanwhile, another unitologist crowd forms back in Union Square. Bram, you might want to get down to Union Square. Abbott's holding one of his sermons. Right now, the foreman and his team are about to remove the marker and bring it inside the glorious day. And we all know what it can do, what awaits us, because it's told us. We won't be here, but we'll be waiting. Cortez, for the last time, please just go home. Listen, Stand my by. children, to the down. voice of God. Now prepare yourselves. No. For a no. Three, Don't worry. Two, one. See you soon. She's dead. She's dead, Marla. Sterling to Central. I'm outside. Can you tell me what that bang was? The flash must have knocked out comms, too. The marker violently reacts to being removed from its pedestal. Communications, life support, and several other tools that are required for Planet Crack are now either damaged or knocked out entirely. The colony's gravity tethers are meant to help lift trillions of tons of rock and mineral to the Ishimura, but in their current state, they run the risk of creating a miniature black hole and wiping out all of Aegis 7. Egan, Sterling, and Caldwell rush inside to address the issue, but they don't realize that the nightmare has only just begun. Sounds like someone's in trouble. Hold on! Wait a second, we don't know what's going on in there. What in God's name are you doing? Get off him! Vachenko, stop! I'll... I'll shoot you! You know these rivet guns pack a punch. Sterling! Oh man, I can't, I can't believe this. Sam, get that rock saw. We may need it. The crew pushes onward to the gravity tether room, A Sterling splits off to save someone calling for help, leaving Egan and Caldwell to deal with repairs. It's death, Sam. Can't you see it? It needs our help. Egan, what the hell are you talking about? Get a grip! But Zachenko... We killed him! I know. But you saw what happened in there. It's... It's like it wasn't really him. This part is really tricky for counting deaths. Several more crazed miners attack Caldwell, but we also see that he's constantly hallucinating, and we can't be sure exactly what is real or not, so I'll recap the death toll once the chaos dies down. You don't understand. It's not right. We have to end it. Ugh, Egan, stop. What are you doing? You can't stop it. You can't fight it. <laughs> Don't, don't make me shoot you. Egan, please! Oh god, Egan. I'm sorry. With no time to process what just happened, Caldwell proceeds to the gravity tether room, fights off anyone in his way, and manages to stabilize the system. Are you okay? Lexine, God, it's good to hear you. 
Things are pretty bad right now. No. I mean, did you hear? Some unitologists just killed themselves in Union Square. There are pictures. It's horrible. People are flipping out all over the colony. We've been attacked and Egan went crazy. I killed him, Lex. I'm scared. Somebody just told me some sectors are losing oxygen, too. Hold on. That could be from the blast. Just hold tight, baby. I'll fix it, I promise. One more round of crazed miners and life-saving maintenance leaves Sam with one goal. To get back to the colony and make sure his girlfriend is safe. The air's cycling again. When are you getting back? I'm on my way, baby. Don't worry. Just stay out of sight, okay? Be careful. I love you. Hello? Who's there? Death is the answer, sir. You'll see. We can't stop it. Oh, Sterling. Oh, God, I thought you were... I've got to get out of here. Back to Lexine. We're all going to die out here. We're not going to die! No! No, leave me alone! I have to get to Lexine, do you hear me? She needs my help! <laughs> no. Lexine! Help me! What? Yeah. You're not. Hostile is down. Repeat. Hostile is down. Good shot, sir. Shooting one of your own is never good. He's not even packing a gun. You're shooting me. This is the guy that slaughtered his entire crew. Why'd you do it, son? All these people never did anything to hurt you. Lex. The total death toll of Extraction Day is 63. 48 of these were from the unitologists in Union Square, and another four were similarly self-inflicted in the following hours. Of the remaining 11 deaths, Sam Caldwell is probably responsible for six of them, being Egan, Sterling, and four that can be seen from the perspective of planetside security. Another four can be seen in the Ishimura's incident reports, and of course, the last death belongs to Caldwell himself, shot dead by a detective from PSEC. These numbers seem to work out really well at first, but I'm not sure how intentional that was, since that would mean almost every encounter in this prologue was nothing more than a hallucination. He's gone. Call Commander James and get Doc Sciarella down here. He's gonna have a busy day. bodies now. Apparently we have a morgue. I assume they're in there. Assume isn't good enough. I want those people on ice. They must be in top condition when we arrive. You really think the condition makes any difference? Better safe than sorry. All recumbents with the church are treated the same way. I know. Don't worry, Captain. You'll get your cemetery. I'd better. Our future is riding on this, Mr. Carthusia. Don't let us down. Back in PSEC headquarters, Newman discovers that all violence on the colony has halted since the marker was extracted and prepared for retrieval. But soon, he's called in for a new issue. An undefined, fleshy growth has appeared in a colony transport tunnel, and Newman notices that it moves when touched. Despite all of these developments, Carthusia refuses to halt the operation, and the marker is retrieved by the Ishimura later that day. One really small but important point to make is that some of the colony's prisoners, notably including the one that killed Dr. Shirello's assistant, were transported to the Ishimura to be detained somewhere around this time. The marker is on its way to you now, Captain. A second shuttle is carrying all murder victims. And the suicides? They're on a third shuttle. The crew are set, just waiting for me to get on board so I can join you. Join us. It's not possible you are to stay on the colony. What? But, Captain, I've given you everything you've asked for. I demand to be part of this. You don't demand anything. Your colony is out of control, and I will not risk the same madness infecting my ship. Once the bodies are on board, I'm issuing a no-fly order between ship and planet side. That's outrageous! It's my decision, and I am in control of this operation. Then if you want those suicide bodies, Captain, you'll have to break your own order and get them yourself. 
Kothuja out. And that's exactly what the captain does. Detective Nathan McNeil. Well, I'll be damned. Gabe Weller. When I requested help from the Ishimura, I didn't realize they had you on board. Since the player character from Dead Space Extraction's prologue is now dead, the game introduces a new pair of protagonists. Gabe Weller, a member of the Ishimura security force tasked with retrieving the leftover bodies, and Nathan McNeil, the PSEC officer that shot Sam Caldwell in the prologue. It's been a long time, Nate. It's good to see you. No, it's been held down here. Some extra hands will come in useful. Sorry, no cop duty. We have an errand. An errand? Gabe, we've got assaults, murder, almost 60 dead and dozens injured. Nobody here has ever seen anything like it. We just can't cope. Cope? Wasn't it you who pulled me out of a three-way firefight on Scorpio 6 and then went back in to plant limpets? And now some crazy miners have got you losing sleep? It's not that simple. So what is this errand anyway? On the morning of local day 925, the same day Planet Crack will be taking place, Captain Matthias sends a four-man crew to retrieve the remaining bodies using one of the Ishimura's own shuttles. Officers Baines and Hutchins stay behind to prepare the shuttle, while Gabe Weller and Private Karklins make their way to the morgue, with Nathan McNeil tagging along to give them directions and drop off Sam Caldwell's rivet gun at the evidence room. Meanwhile, Newman, Jansen, and Dr. Shirello notice that those who come into contact with the marker start writing in the same code found on the artifact itself. Jansen in particular tries using this to decode the marker's purpose. I think I know what the marker is. Yeah, I'm thrilled. Come on, planet cracks in less than an hour. We should go. Bram, listen. It's some kind of code, like an instruction set. <sighs> instructions for what? It has to do with DNA, I think. I'm still working on the specifics. If we're gonna make the OB, we have to leave now. You coming or not? Marla! Damn it. Patrol, this is Glider 1. We have confirmed operational final. All units standing by. All right, Mr. White. Pop the cork. Roger that, Control. Planet crack initiated. 1200 local standard time. We Planet crack goes smoothly at first, but something even more dangerous than the marker is still hiding beneath the planet's surface. So you're the rookie, huh? McCabe to McNeil. Nate, you there? McNeil here. What's up? Multiple assault in the mess hall in your sector. Sounds like a riot down there. McCabe out. I told you things were crazy down here. You sure this is the right mall? We only have one. I was here just yesterday. It was a full house. Not anymore. I'll need to see a manifest. Captain Moan like this. Sir, there's a toe tag here. Abbott D. Ring any bells, McNeil? Hold on. I'll pull him up. He's on file, but there's no record of a transfer. He should be right here. You? What are you doing here? Get out! Doc, you all right? He's lost it! Help! With the colony's dementia ramping up more than ever, this doctor becomes the first death we see on the day of Planet Crack. That look in his eyes reminded me of a kid that went crazy last week. Just an engineer, but something in him snapped. And just like when the marker was extracted, multiple systems all fail at once, this time plunging the entire colony into darkness. Bram, it's Marla. You there? Yeah, they just fell. Monitors down! Marla? Marla, come in! The hell? Is that normal? Not really, no. Hold on, I've got a glow worm. Whatever it was must have knocked out the elevator too. Great. No lights, no elevators, no bodies. Sir, what's going on? Keep it together, Private. Sergeant Weller to Ishimura. Come in, Ishimura. Damn it! We can get up through the medical hall instead. Let's go. Where the hell are the backup generators? Ah! Can you... There's no time, Tom. I tried to warn you. Now it's too late. At this point, a lot happens all at once. Newman manages to meet up with Jansen, but McNeil's group runs into another group of crazed miners, and the growths found in the tunnels have now spread completely out of control, eventually lashing out and killing the two colonists tasked with burning them away. This adds another 8 to the death toll, but it's now pretty much impossible to get an exact number of victims. Sounds like your rookie's losing it. Yeah. 
Reckon whatever's gotten to everyone else down here has gotten to him too. Shouldn't you take his firearm? <laughs> if he cracks, I'll deal with it. The day I can't put down a rookie is the day I hang up my boots. <laughs> I can't believe Cochrane's did that. With the rookie dead, McNeil and Weller are forced to barricade themselves inside PSEC to escape the other colonists. At the same time, colony manager Carthusia roams the dark halls, making his way to the morgue. So undignified. I'm so sorry you couldn't join the others. I don't know if there'll be another chance, but with a little luck we might... Ah, at last. Carthusia to the Ishimura. Ishimura, can you hear me? Damn it all to hell. This is Jones. Open call to all PSEC officers. Listen up. Body shots, don't put these things down. Aim for the limbs, take out the joints to immobilize them. What things? What's he talking about? Dunno. He can't mean the colonists. Is there something else in here? Either that, or he's flipped like everyone else around here. Dr. Tom? It's John Wellen. Do you hear me, Tom? Are you there? I'm here. What in God's name is going on? Hell if I know, but we've got mass panic and bodies are starting to stack up. Say what? More murders? People are dying here, but I don't know how or what- What the hell? Hold on, John. Huh? Nobody here? So who- Oh. I don't- I can't believe this- Don't touch them. You're right. We should call the M.E. No, I mean, we have to get out of here right now. You remember I said the carvings were some kind of instructions for DNA? DNA doesn't just get up and go walk about to kill people. It does if it's recombinant. A DNA that mutates genes at the cellular level, like a cancer or a virus. But it only spreads to a specific target vector. What? Speak English for God's sake! Necrotic flesh, Bram! It infects dead bodies! Altman be praised. I think now's a good time to explain what's really going on here. A restricted log in Dead Space describes how nearly 300 years ago, Michael Altman was expelled from the Black Marker Research Project, and he was later killed to stop his public outcry on the dangers of the Marker. Before his death, Altman himself managed to sink the Marker's research station into the Gulf of Mexico, but some of his work was recovered by the Earth's government, which, at this point, was known as the Sovereign Colonies. They believed that with Altman's research, they could replicate the marker for use in energy production or warfare. But to keep a level of secrecy, they created three research stations on the distant planets known as Aspera, Cremar, and Aegis VII. By the year 2299, all three locations managed to produce their own marker nearly identical to the original outside of their red hue. The scientists on Aegis VII eventually noticed a marker signal could be translated into DNA instructions, which they used to create a recombinant microbial life form. While it appeared dormant at first, the microbes could reproduce by recombining any dead tissue it came into contact with. This included any dead skin cells in the air, so without the scientists realizing it, the air vents slowly filled up with the same fleshy growths found by Newman in the transport tunnels, which would later become known as corruption. This log also kind of makes it sound like it's the corruption that causes insomnia and dementia rather than the marker itself. In some kind of unexplained accident, two scientists are killed and infected with this recombinator, transforming into what we now know as necromorphs. The infection contorts the muscles, bones, and cartilage of the dead, creating living weapons meant to stab, slash, and tear through the living, which then become additional necromorphs. This outbreak quickly overtakes Aegis 7, but their one saving grace was a field right around the marker known as the Dead Space. <laughs> the explanation for this field has sort of changed over time, but the important thing to understand is that all recombinator cells essentially become inert within it. One of the few remaining scientists has a vision about a device that can amplify this dead space, which the Aegis 7 research team immediately begins work on. After the completion of this transmitter in the form of a pedestal, the necromorph outbreak dies down, and the remaining crew are assumed to have escaped Aegis 7. Fifteen years later, the Sovereign Colonies realize that all the other marker sites have fallen in a similar manner, and in order to bury all remaining knowledge of the markers, the survivors of Aegis 7 are all executed as a part of Scenario 5. The Sovereign Colonies are then dissolved, allowing EarthGov to take over and establish the Aegis system as restricted space. Within the next 200 years, 
all of the dead matter left on Aegis 7 converge into a massive life form known as the Hive Mind, which has the power to telepathically control any nearby necromorphs, but was kept dormant by the marker and its pedestal. This is why the colony later moving the red marker in 2508 led to a resurgence of corruption in the tunnels and vents, but it wasn't until the day of planet crack that the hive mind was revealed beneath the surface. Now, history repeats itself as a recombinator outbreak takes over Aegis 7 once again. What makes you think anyone will come to the med lab anyway? It's chaos! Because that's where people will expect us to be, where people will come when they're injured. You're right. But if we get too many in here, we... What the hell? Now what? The bodies. Where the hell are they? Never mind. Everybody wash up and get some gloves on. From what we've seen so far, it's gonna be a long night. What was that? Don't tell me we've got a leak too. Oh. Back on the Ishimura, communication systems are barely functioning, and they only manage to catch small glimpses of what's attacking the colony. Within minutes, more than half of the population is slaughtered, with one monitor on the Ishimura showing a sample of 48 colonists, 34 of which are now dead. If this sample is applied to the total population, then over 21,000 colonists can now be added to the death toll. Over in PSEC headquarters, McNeil and Weller find zero survivors from the security force, all while still unaware of the necromorph outbreak. So aliens do exist. And they're trying to kill us. Isn't life dandy? <laughs> I love these guys. Anyways, after fighting off more necromorphs invading the building, the pair does manage to find one survivor. Thanks for the help! Who the hell are you? Easy, Weller. She's not p -Sec. I'm McNeil. What's your name? Lexine. Lexine Murdoch. Well, Lexine, you're a lucky girl. Lucky? My boyfriend was killed last week. My father's gone missing and now this? Wait a second. I recognize you. You're Sam Caldwell's emergency contact. What are you doing here? My father's missing. He disappeared at the same time all those unitologists killed themselves. I came to see if there was any news, but then those... things came in and started killing everyone. Ishimura! The colony is under attack from unknown hostiles! Orbital comms must have gone down with the rest of the electrics. We're on our own. Wait. You're from the ship? You must have a shuttle, right? She's right. Baines and Hutchins will be waiting for us. Come on, McNeil. Wait. What about me? You should come with us. Right, Sergeant? She's your responsibility. Fine. Let's go. This next part is another one that's a little tricky to fit into the continuity, since it also happens in PSEC headquarters, so let's just say it happened in another section of the building. Newman and Jensen witness an officer's body slowly transform into an infector, a type of necromorph that can inject a sort of bile into other bodies for a much quicker transformation, which usually creates the most common form of necromorph, the slasher. Newman and Jensen narrowly escape, and much like McNeil's group, they decide that reaching the shuttle bay is their best hope. At this point, another half of the remaining population will have probably died by now, and all remaining notable characters are heading towards the bay. All of them, except for Colin and Jennifer Barrow. Luckily for Colin, he currently has access to his own shuttle to help supervise Planet Crack, but with communications down, he has no way of knowing what awaits him on the planet's surface. It's a ghost town in here. Where the hell is everybody? I'm gonna check on Jen. Catch you later. Jen? Where are you? These symbols are the same as... No! Shuttle Bay's just down the
down the hall. Go on! With both Newman and McNeil's groups narrowly escaping the Necromorphs, the shuttle bay is right within their reach, and Colin Barrow has his own method of escape elsewhere. Refusing to accept his wife's death, he takes her body and makes his way back to his shuttle. Hold on, baby. We're going home. <laughs> This is the Unitologist's fault, isn't it? Why couldn't they leave things alone? I'm not sure it would have made any difference. But all the people that have died, what if we're the only ones who made it? I remember this area. The shuttle bay's just up the square, right? That's right. Good. Baines, Hutchins, give me a sit rep. In the shuttle and standing by, Sarge. It's bloody chaos down here, though. I had to break a few noses to stop people piling in with us. Everyone's looking for a way out. Wait, one. Two, there's only five shuttles here. One must have left already. And I guess there is a chance. Everybody, with me! Stay close! How long till we reach the Ishimura? We've got some injured back there. Buddy, with this payload, we'll be lucky if we can break orbit. Look! There's one taking off now. There's a sight for sore eyes. Wait. Something's wrong. It's no good! We're carrying too many people. I'm taking her back down. What? No! Turn around! Get us to the ship! I can't! Then I will! What the hell are you doing? Let go! She's gonna crash! Get down! This is Sergeant Bram Newman. PSEC evacuation report. The shuttle's gone. Took off and then crashed right back down into the bay. Took a whole crowd with it. Must be a hundred people dead. We've lost the rest of the shuttles. God help us. There's no way out. Anyone hearing this, do not land. I repeat, do not land on Aegis 7. They left us to die. At this point, the death toll includes over 29,000 people, and I'd guess there are only around 100 survivors left. 50 of which would be on the shuttle that made it off Aegis 7, and then another 50 would be those who survived the crash or are hiding throughout the colony. Although, there's still one character that doesn't fall into either category, who is currently approaching the Ishimura on his own ship despite the no-fly order. Shuttle 7, this is the Ishimura. You are ordered to return to the surface immediately. Do you read me? You cannot land on board the Ishimura. Over! Landing, pressing, or shot down! Pick one! But there's no way in hell we're going back! Colin Barrow is now the fourth person we see escape Aegis 7. But as he'll soon find out, an infector managed to slip onto his shuttle, and Jennifer Barrow's body is now the perfect target for recombination. While Colin probably doesn't last very long after that, he still falls under our criteria for surviving Aegis 7 specifically, so he will not count towards the death toll. Back on the surface, only a handful of colonists survived the crash from before. Bram? Here? The hell happened? No idea. But that was every last shuttle we had. You said you'd get us out of here. You said we'd be safe. Hey, I, I'm sorry, kid. I really thought we could do it. Maybe we still can. We just need to call the ship. How? Comms have been down since Planet Crack, remember? So we go to the source. If I can transmit directly through the needle, I could get a better signal and maybe reach the Ishimura. You don't seriously think that's gonna work? No, but I'm not gonna sit on my ass and wait to die. Coming? Right outside of the shuttle port, McNeil's crew searches for survivors and manages to find our final notable character. Wait! Lucky man. What's your name? <coughs> Warren... <coughs> Warren Eckhart! You're lucky to even be alive after that. The shuttles! They're all gone. We're stuck here. Not necessarily. There's a surveying shuttle in the Sector 8 maintenance bay. Are you sure? Quite sure. I hitched a ride on it yesterday from the Ishimura. You're from the ship? What are you doing here? CEC business. And none of yours, Sergeant. Who cares? Let's just find the shuttle and go. Now every notable survivor has a set goal in mind. 
Newman and Jensen aim to contact the Shimura from the main comms needle, and McNeil's group makes their way through the underground tunnels towards the final shuttle left on the planet. Sarge, this is Baines. Are you there? Baines! Jesus, I thought I'd lost you! If we hadn't been inside the shuttle, we'd be toast. It's a wreck though. We won't be flying anywhere in it. Where are you? We're in a megabent, heading to the Sector 8 maintenance bay. There's a shuttle we can use. But we sealed off the entrance here. Can you find another route? We'll do our best, Sarge. See you there. With no other route, the group is forced to crawl through the air vents. But with McNeil in the lead, all four characters arrive safely at the bay. There's your men. Baines, this is Weller. We're right behind you. I see you, Sarge. <laughs> Hit a spot above her when we got here. Sir, the shuttle's locked. We can't get inside. My access code will open it. Then let's go for it. Everybody ready to run? We'll meet you halfway. I'll take point. Eckhart, stay close. Go! Oh, and just as a quick check-in, you didn't forget about the hive mind, right? Stand there, Sergeant! Come on! Good work, soldier. This is bigger than we thought. Relax. It's dead. Eckhart, get up here and second me. I can fly, but I don't know survey craft. Thank you, Nate. Without you, we wouldn't have got this far. Don't mention it. Ah! What was that? It's not dead! Go! Go! Is he insane? No! Oh my god! It's coming right at us! Hold on to something! Main thrust is a fright! We're gonna die! I've landed in worse shape than this! McNeil! Intercept that cannon fire! Brace yourselves! We're too fast! All four members survive the crash. Using the four suits left on the shuttle, Nathan McNeil, Gabe Weller, Lexi Murdoch, and Warren Eckert all managed to enter the Ishimura's crew deck through a maintenance hatch, successfully escaping the outbreak on Aegis 7. Come on, let's get you inside. Thank you for not leaving me. You're not like Weller. <laughs> Amen to that. Now, only two known survivors are left on the planet. You sure it's this way? Seems a little off the beaten track. It's unmanned. Only engineers come out here. Wait, that door. It should be locked. And maybe someone got here before us. Or something. Jesus, look at this stuff. What is it? Does this stuff grow outside too? Because if it's growing over the needle, it might explain the problems. Let's just find a terminal so you can do your thing. This is where the power router should be. Oh. What is that? Cortez! Oh, no! Graham, we have to go! This is no good! Oh, Vera. Graham, snap out of it! Abort! Damn it, abort! Oh. Graham! Ah. Oh, Marla. Oh. And that's the whole story. They say there are no atheists in foxholes. After what happened here, it's more like the other way around. I'm gonna leave this recording. 
Who knows? You might see something that convinces you. Don't come looking for me. You may not like what you find. The total estimated death toll on Age of Seven comes to 30,000 people. Eight characters were added to the population during this story, but that's balanced out by the eight people that managed to escape. As for what happens next on the Ishimura, I actually will not be covering that within this video. This is already the longest video I've ever done, and by the time I edit this, it'll probably have been over a month since my last upload. I super appreciate you sticking around to the end, and if you want to further support the channel, then all the algorithm supporting stuff like commenting or subscribing will be a huge help. Again, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.